the king of Aram had made himself rich, filling his coffers with the goods, the possessions, and the wealth of Israel by perfecting the art of stealthy surprise raids in the land of Israel. He was able to figure out where the king was going to be, where the money was going to be, where the possessions were going to be, and he found ways to sneak in and steal things when they were not prepared. And he was getting wealthy on it, and Israel was getting poorer and poorer by the raid. He set up one opportunity to go and do this, and something weird happened, and, and, it, and it was prompted by God through the prophet Elisha. And the prophet Elisha sent message to the king of Israel and said, don't go down to that place. The Arameans are going down there. Well, the king of Aram, by the way, in this section in 2 Kings, it never tells you the name of the king of Aram or the name of the king of Israel at the time. The point isn't the, the kings, the point isn't the people, the point is God. And God speaking to his people so that if his people will listen, he will provide for them, he will protect them, he will watch over them. And the king was set up in his ambush, ready to steal, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited. Nothing but crickets and sand fleas. He was upset. He turned to his own men and he said, look, there's no way they would know about this. Somebody here told him, who is the traitor? His men turned to him and said, king, no way. They say, none of us, my lord king, but Elisha, the prophet who was in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. God knows your very thoughts that you Express out loud or think in your mind while you're in a hidden place. When I was in high school, I was very outspoken about my faith. And I had an English teacher who felt like I needed to be taken down a couple pegs. So, kind of out of her norm of behavior for me, when we all started class, she asked me to go to the office and get something for her. And I'm happy to get out of class, and so I go to the office, and I get this thing. I don't even, I don't remember what it was. And I came back to, the off, to, to her classroom, and I put it on her desk, and as I was walking back to my, my chair, my desk, she stopped and said, Len, I have a question for you. And I didn't know what was going on. I, I shot a quick arrow prayer, and I said, Lord, give me words to say. And I can't honestly, for the life of me, remember what her question was, but I do know this. She had coached the class. She told the class that Christians are rather, well, they're rather uniform. They all think the same way. It's very difficult to find a Christian who can have an original thought. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to ask Len a question, and he's going to give me this answer. You watch and see for yourself. So she asked me her question, and I paused, and I answered her question, and her jaw dropped open. There were students all around the classroom. I heard snickering. I, heard, I saw smirks. I saw I heard giggles, and it, that was the end of it. She never bothered me again. It wasn't until later that somebody told me what had happened. They told me about her coaching them. They told me about what she had said disparagingly about Christians. And at that point, God brought to memory a passage that the worship team read to us, for us this morning. And here's the passage from Psalm 119, 99. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I knew nothing. I mean, this lady intellectually could have, you know, beat me under the rug. I mean, there's no way I could have stood up to her. She was a very intellectual lady. I couldn't have matched wits with her. But because God is true to his word, he gave me the opportunity to witness to that entire class without ever even knowing it. God speaks to his people. God speaks to you and he speaks to me through his word. The king of Israel was wise to listen to the word of God through the prophet Elijah. And you and I are wise to listen to the word of God through his written word, to be in the word of God. Now, last week, 
as we began this series of moving from good to great, we said that we all take a step toward greatness when each of us lay aside our own good plans for God's great plans and open our tables to let the stranger in. And we ended with the question, who am I going to invite into my table? Who does God want me to share my life with? Is there someone he wants me to mentor? Is there someone he wants me to apprentice? Is there someone who he wants me to share Jesus with so that they come to know him? This morning, I want to go back to the table. Now, this table is a little bit different. This is a table that instead of having four chairs to start with anyway, we only have two chairs. And, and this table, honestly, it's really cluttered with all kinds of things. Things that we spend our time with, spend, things that we invest our time with. I mean, we, I don't know, you've, you've read all the stats and how many hours we spend watching TV. And if we don't have TV, we can use Netflix or we can use YouTube or, or actually we can surf the, net, the web so much time out of, out of every day that we end up investing lots of time that way. We like playing board games around my house, and there's nothing wrong with playing a board game or watching TV or being on the internet. However, when all our time is spent doing that, entertaining ourselves, then maybe, maybe we need to question what we're doing with our time. Or, I don't know about you, but I end up with subscriptions to a bazillion different magazines. You go down to my office, and I've got a table that's got magazines everywhere. There's all kinds of things you can do, and me being a bibliophile, as I've already confessed, love reading. But sometimes that reading can distract me from what's most important. This table is the table where you come and sit, and the only thing that's there is the Word of God. And the only person that's there is Jesus. Because it's important for us to know that if we're going to move from good to great in our faith and as a church, it's only going to happen when each of us decide that we're going to take the Word of God seriously. And we're going to spend time in the Word of God listening to Jesus, allowing the Holy Spirit to illuminate it in our minds and hearts to help us understand what it says. And more than that, We have to take what we know is true and apply it to our lives. So today we're going to talk about why that doesn't happen. Have you ever memorized a passage of Scripture or, or maybe heard somebody speak about a passage of Scripture and, and you find that your life really doesn't line up with it even though you know better? I went to Dallas Seminary. And I, I was a security guard for my, almost my four years there. They called us the agents of God. Um, and uh, one of the things that my, my boss told me about was a time when he had to go to the cafeteria and break up a fight between two seniors. And when he broke the fight up, he said, guys, what are you fighting about? They were fighting about the filling of the Spirit. Have you ever found yourself in that place? You know what the word says, but you're not. Your life doesn't line up to it. Now, my purpose today is not to, to lay a bunch of guilt on us. My purpose is to free us up to see that God wants to speak to you. What do you think about yourself? When you look in the mirror, what do you think about yourself? Does it line up with what the word of God says to you? Let me say it more personally. Does it line up with what God himself thinks of you? I'll, I'll just confess, I struggle with this one. Now maybe that's not your area of struggle. Maybe there's something else. Maybe in your mind you think, if I don't have a certain amount of money in my accounts, then I don't feel secure. Could it be 
that God wants you and me to feel secure even if we're flat broke? Could it be? Or maybe, maybe if I'm not in the relationship I really want to be in, whether you're unmarried or married, has, you feel like God's let you down? You feel like God is not in the middle of that? Could it be that the Word of God has the answers we need, but we don't believe it? We don't believe it. Open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you use in a pew Bible, it's page 833. Now, I know one of the blessings of our, of our congregation is we've got many people in our congregation who English is not their first language. So even though I'm asking you to open your Bibles and I really want us to make that our habit, the passages we look at will be on the screen as well. Because I know talking to my international friends who English is their second or third or fourth language, it's, it helps them to have it on the screen as well. But please don't let that make you lazy. Let's open up the Word of God. Let's get into the Word of God for ourselves and follow along with it together. So we'll start together. Verse 10. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, endurance, persecution, and suffering, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, I Iconium, and Lystra, and the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact... Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus." All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. When we read this passage, we typically will we'll jump right down to the end, the part where it says all scripture is God-breathed and is useful and lists off all the ways it's useful. And that is really critical and really important. But we really don't get there unless we first look at verses 10 to 15. And in verses 10 to 15, Paul talks about the things that God had been doing in his life. He talks about his faith, his patience, his love, his endurance, his persecutions, and his sufferings. And we scan right over that, and he talks about places like Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. Well, if you want to read all about what Paul is talking about here, you can go back to the book of Acts chapter 13 and 14. Because Paul lays out what happened there. Now listen to this, because Paul is saying, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable, it's beneficial, it's, it's all that you need for life and godliness. But you got to understand that if you're going to live a godly life, you're going to be persecuted. There's going to be things that will happen in your life that will cause you to doubt the word of God. Anybody ever feel like when a, when a hard time is coming in your life, maybe it's a persecution of some sort or an illness or a financial setback or a relational rift, whatever's going on, you ever feel like God has forgotten me? If God loved me, why would I go through this? Paul had a completely different perspective because he believed the word of God. And when he believed the word of God, it transformed his behavior and when his behavior was changed, transformed, God changed and transformed him personally. So believing God's truth will change your behavior and it will transform your life. But in order to believe it, the fire has to be applied sometimes. And that's what happened to Paul. When he went to Antioch, this is from Acts 13 and verse 50. But the Jews incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and threw them out of the region. They did not want to see their faces anymore. Get out of here. And what did Paul do? 
Well, he went home and he had a vacation because he was very rejected and sad. No, he went from Antioch to Iconium and the heat was turned up a little bit more. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the word of God. They, they get kicked out of one place and then things get stirred up to the point where they, they are so upset with them that they are going to stone them to take their lives and they barely escape with the clothes on their back. What did they do next? Okay, now... Now it's, it's hard. Now it's tough. Now we're going home. No, they went on to Lystra. Because, and because Paul performed an incredible miracle, he healed a man who had been born lame. He'd never walked, taken a step in his life. He healed this guy, and the people of Lystra thought that two of the Greek gods had come down, and they wanted to worship them. They wanted to make sacrifices to them. The priest was was going nuts saying hey they've come down it's awesome and he's bringing the animals out and they're setting up a, a quick altar and they're going to sacrifice to him right then and there and Paul and Silas said no stop we're men just like you the finger shouldn't be pointed at us the finger should be pointed at Jesus who gave us the ability to do this and when they did that this, this crowd that held them in, in worship and awe turned into a murderous mob Listen what happens. Some Jews came from Antioch and, I, Antioch and Iconium. Recognize those names? The two places they had just been, right? Some Jews from those two, two cities came and, when the, and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. You catch that? I was reading this and I thought, wait a minute. I never noticed that. He went back into the city. He's not afraid. And the next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. And you know what he did in Derby? He preached the gospel that almost got him killed. Because Paul believed the word of God. He believed that the gospel was the only thing that could transform people's lives. And he was committed to it come death or life. It did not matter. He was going to, to preach the word of God because his behavior was altered by what he knew to be true. And God had transformed him into an evangelistic machine. And then after that, guess what he did? He went back to Antioch. He went back to Iconium. And he went back to Lystra. They preached the good news in that city. This is chapter 14 and verse 21. And won the large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, the place where they stoned him and left him for dead. And then to Iconium, where they ran him out of town. And to Antioch, where they wanted to do both of those things and didn't get a chance to. Strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain in the faith. And then he says, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Duh. That's the example he sets for us. I don't think we believe it, though. Because when hard times come for us, we run. We think God is mad at us. You've heard it said that the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. Jesus was always in the center of God's will, and look, look what happened to him. Suffering and persecution is part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. The question that we have to ask is, do we believe it? Do we believe God's word is true? And will we, will we let his word alter our behavior so that he can transform us from the inside out? Now, the, from the beginning of Paul's new life in Jesus, he preached God's word wherever he went, to whomever God would open a door. And then at the end of his life, he instructed one of his many apprentices, Timothy, to follow in his footsteps. Listen to what he says 
in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. So we're back in 2 Timothy now. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instructions. Now, why do you think Paul would tell Timothy to follow his example? Paul's preaching was constantly getting him in trouble. Didn't he care about Timothy? I mean, he called him his son in the faith. And then in 2 Corinthians, listen to this litany of all the things that happened to Paul because he had the audacity to continue preaching the word. He just wouldn't shut up. He says, I've been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. He was in danger all the time because he wouldn't shut up. Because he believed the gospel would change lives. And he was committed to it. I labored, I have labored and toiled and have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have got, often gone, gone without food. I have been cold and naked besides everything else. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Now, does that sound like the successful life that you would want your children to aspire to? Why was it Paul's dying wish? And that's what it was because in 2 Timothy 4, we know that Paul later said, I'm, I'm ready to be poured out like a drink offering. I've, I've run the race. I've kept the faith. Why would his dying wish be that his son pick up where he left off? I think the answer is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. How from infancy, he's talking to Timothy, you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for the salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. He knew that the scriptures were the only thing that could make you wise for salvation. You will not find life any other place. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples at one point when lots of people left him? He says, are you going to leave me too? Remember Peter? Where would we go? You have the words of life. Jesus is the source of life. But there's a difference between having intellectual knowledge of the truths of God's word and believing them. When we believe God's word, it alters our behavior and transforms our lives. So the way to know whether you believe something or not is, does it work its way out into your life? Do you practice what you say you believe? Do you trust God to fulfill what he says when we say we are standing on the promises of God? Truth changes us only when we believe it. And when we believe it, he will transform our lives. And then the truth will really be setting us free. And when my behavior and, and your behavior and, and your behavior and, and your behavior and your behavior align with God's word, then he will transform our community. And he will turn us into people who will follow in the line of an apostle Paul or a Timothy. And we will preach the word. We will be in season and out of season. We will reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We'll live it. God's word is the catalyst for transformation. Let me say that a little bit differently. Believing God's word is the catalyst for transformation. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man or person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. When God speaks through his word, he redirects our lives. He changes
changes us. He takes us from the path that we were on and puts us on the path he wants us to be on. In the 4th or 5th century AD, there was a black scholar, a self-described narcissist named Augustine, who was bent on his own way until one day he was sitting in a park and he heard a little girl sing this little children's song. Pick it up and read. Pick it up and read. He happened to have some, some papers with some of the letters of the Apostle Paul on it. And he picked it up. And God changed his life. 1900 years later, Augustine's confessions and his city of God are still influencing people today. A young 23-year-old man named Charles Haddon Spurgeon was about to preach to the largest crowd he had ever preached to. This crowd would be filled with dignitaries and very important people. It was going to be in the, the most prestigious venue of the time, the Crystal Auditorium in, in England. He was nervous, understandably so. And so the night before, he went into the auditorium and he stood on the stage. And in the, in the quietness of this room, he quoted John 129. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He wanted to test out the acoustics. He did not preach his message. He did not deliver this well-crafted missile that he wanted to, to give to people. He simply quoted John 129. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There was a custodian in the way upper balcony in the dark cleaning up and he heard out of the darkness behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and it broke him. He repented, he fell on his face and he put his faith and trust in Jesus. The word of God is powerful. It's not about how great we are and how, how effectively we speak. It's about God's word because it is breathed out by God. And it is useful. It is useful for teaching, for training us in the truth. It's useful for rebuking. When we get caught in the trap of sin, someone who loves us enough to see that and is close enough to us can say, wait a minute, brother, wait a minute, sister, that's not the way you should go. It is useful for correcting. When we are thinking or acting in a, in a way that's, that's not true to the word of God, the word and hopefully a friend will come to us and correct us. And it is useful for training in righteousness to help us stay on the right path. And if the word of God does not have power in your life and my life, it's not because the word is defective. It's because we don't believe it. Dr. Gene and I were sitting at Einstein's last week talking about the, the relationship between behavior and belief. Um, often to bring about change in our lives, when we see a behavior that, that isn't what it ought to be, we attack that behavior. We, we start a new habit. We make a New Year's resolution. You ever wonder why those things go the way of the dodo by January 3rd almost every year? I will tell you that it's because you don't really believe. You attack the behavior, but you don't attack your belief. Because if you will change your belief, then your behavior will change, and then you will be transformed. So, as we were talking, it struck me. And let me try this statement out on you. Um... I'm one of those kind of people I process verbally, and oftentimes I'm hearing something for the first time and it's coming out of my mouth. I'm one of those guys. Sorry, but that's me. I said, change behavior without change belief is hypocrisy. Change behavior without change belief is hypocrisy. Gutting it out, making it happen, may bring about a short-term change, but it will not transform my life. And I think we've all experienced that. 
Now, as we tease this idea out, it struck me that, that some have said it, and I've even said it myself, that we often uh, allow our feelings or our hearts to lead us, but our feelings or our hearts are not good leaders. They really need to be led by the truth. And so there are times when we must fake it till we make it. You ever say that? And, and maybe you found that to be true, fake it till we make it. But as we talked about this, I thought, now doesn't that contradict what I just said, that change behavior without change belief is hypocrisy? Now, I think there's a really important truth here that, that I think God is drilling down into me, and I hope that it will be meaningful to you as well. Um, I think that the answer to that is no. Is it wrong to say fake it till we make it? I'd say no. Because when I fake it till I make it, it's because I'm choosing to believe something that I believe is true, but I don't yet feel. I haven't yet experienced it. And so what I'm doing is I'm telling my heart, be quiet. I'm telling my feelings, you're not the boss of me. I am going to choose to believe God. And I will trust that he will then change my behavior and he will transform my life. Because as I walk in the truth, he will then line my feelings up under what is true as he transforms me. If in my core, I believe that I'm fat, that I'm lazy, that I can't lose weight, then I can make myself diet I can make myself exercise. I can even lose some weight. But I will always put it back on because I believe in my heart of hearts that I'm fat, that I'm lazy, that I can't lose weight. Now that's a simple illustration. We can apply it in thousands of different ways in our own lives. But for real lasting change to take place, I have to believe what God believes about me. What does God believe about you? And this was a, <clears throat> this was a revelation to me. Um, I, I am at my heart kind of a people pleaser. And, and fr frankly, life has just beaten it out of me. Because if all you do is go through your life pleasing people, you will never please God. And your whole world will revolve around you. And it will always be around what feels good to you and, and what you want to accomplish. And you'll always be wondering, what does someone else think about me? And that's a prison. God began setting me free. And here's one of the things that he did to do that. He showed me this passage that Paul wrote. And it was like Paul was talking to me. I'm sitting down and I'm reading this. And it's like Paul said, Len, come on over here. I got something to tell you. He says... I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It's the Lord who judges me. So here's the way it came out to me. And I don't mean this in a mean way at all. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you think. I don't even care what I think. I only care what God thinks. Because his opinion is the only opinion that matters. <clears throat> now maybe you'll be able to identify it with this with me. But I didn't realize just how deeply this was rooted in me. Until I was looking in the mirror, checking my look. And this thing is kind of ruminating in me. It had been for weeks. And I looked myself in the eye and I said, I don't care what you think. Have you ever done that? You look in the mirror and you're like, oh. <laughs> well, what if you could look in the mirror and just say, I'm a child of God. I'm God's son. I'm God's daughter. He loved me so much, he sent his son to die for me. If I were the only person in the world, he would die for me. How dare I think differently than what he thinks about me? 
And so without any kind of meanness of heart or selfishness, it doesn't matter what someone else thinks about you. It doesn't even matter what you think about you. What, what matters is what God thinks about you. And so what does God think about you? Do you know what God thinks about you? We've wasted so much time caring about what others think, trying to meet their expectations, trying to fulfill their, their ideas of who we should be. What does God think about you? We will discover what God thinks about us when we spend time in this book, letting him speak to us, letting him transform us, letting him change us. And honestly, the only opinion that matters is his. What does he think about it? When I encounter God's word through the truth, he exposes me to his mind for me in what he thinks of me, in what he desires for me. Everybody's got an agenda. Everybody. And, and if you're not careful, you'll live your life based on what someone else wants or needs without even really thinking that what God wants. But if we will let his word speak to us, then it says in verse 17, the person dedicated to God will be capable and equipped for every good work. Because Paul believed the word of God, it altered his behavior and it transformed his life, his trajectory in life. Now, there was, there's something really interesting that, I, that I, I noticed in one of his letters. And I'd never really noticed this before, but think about this. He says in, in Philippians 4, now, in Philippians, he's in, he's in jail when he wrote this letter, right? Um, in Philippians 4, uh, end of the book, he says, Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus, and brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially, listen, those who belong to Caesar's household. Especially those who belong to Caesar's household. So here's the deal. He's in prison. The Praetorian Guard is in charge of him. And what we know about the Praetorian Guard is that every six hours, a different person was chained to Paul. And that person would come and they'd probably say, oh, there he is, that loudmouth. He never shuts up about that Jesus. Blah, blah, blah. And they bring reading, they bring earphones, they do everything they can to block him out. And Paul, when he sees him come and says, oh, fresh meat. Someone who needs to know about Jesus. Someone whose eternity is going to be changed because they spent time with me. How do you think the household of Caesar became followers of Jesus? Right under his nose. He put someone in prison who was changing everything. Now think about it. Paul was in prison. If you were in prison, would you be preaching the gospel? Another occasion. Paul and Silas are in prison, and they're singing. And God brings an earthquake, and he brings the jailer to Jesus, and his life is transformed for forever because they were singing, because they believed God's word. And it altered their behavior, and it transformed their lives and changed the trajectory of their life. Together, we can move from being a good church
so that we can do life together, so that we can hold each other accountable. See, in a, in a, in a gathering like this, we can make a decision. But there's no accountability. There's no one to encourage us. There's no one to help us. There's no one to maybe correct us or rebuke us because nobody knows. We can be isolated in a crowd. But if we're going to be serious about letting his word transform us, change our behavior so that our lives are transformed, we might want to consider being involved in a life group. Getting involved in a relationship. And last week we talked about maybe mentoring or apprenticing. Bringing someone into your world, your sphere of influence that you can invest in. I think the challenge that each and every one of us needs to, needs to come to terms with is, am I going to believe the word? And am I going to allow myself to be in a relationship where somebody who knows I say I believe this will help me see that my behavior changes so that he can transform me to make me the person he wants me to be. I think that when we believe, we can be transformed. And my prayer for us is that we would be serious about that. If, if, you're, if you're thinking to yourself, you know what, I want to be involved in it. There's a contact card in the pew in front of you. When the offering plate comes by, just, just write your contact information and write down, I believe. Or write down community. You choose what you want to write down. And I'll get a hold of you this week and we'll talk about how we can help you get in community. Maybe maybe as, as we were talking this morning, you thought, you know, I really don't know what God believes about me. I've done some research and I have some things that I can send to you that will help you dig into the Word to know what God thinks about you. And it will transform your behavior and transform your life. How would you how do you feel like the Spirit is prompting you to believe and be transformed? Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful that, that nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing can keep us back from all that you have for us except our unbelief. Lord, we, we don't want to be those who, who, who miss out on what you have for us through unbelief. Lord, I pray that you'll, you'll do an inventory with us in our lives and show us the things that we have intellectual knowledge of but we don't believe and that you would bring someone into our lives that will help us, that will encourage us, that will come alongside us and partner up with us and be our brother or sister to help us to become the people you want us to be and to transform us as individuals